today. Uh, children program is going to be right here after we get our call to worship and that stuff done and introduce the program. Uh, the, uh, I think we have coffee hour after too. We have uh, pick up Christmas loot boxes Tuesday, December 19th. We have on Wednesday prayer group at 10 a.m. on the stage. On Thursday, Bible study at 3, following the Advent theme, Prepare the Way for the Lord. A food pantry refresh on December 24th and December 31st. The uh, Christmas Eve service, it'll be at 4 o'clock. The uh, I think that's a that's all I got. Pastor's got some that she wants to tell you about. Uh, turn it over to her. Okay. And uh, one thing was on the. There we go. There we go. Now it's on. Um, Bible study and prayer group on the slide were switched. Prayer group is Thursday at ten on the stage. The Bible study is three o'clock Wednesday in the fellowship hall. So just, that's the way it has been. So uh, just to make note that that was switched this morning. Um, check for sign up sheets on the table out here for things like communion helpers. And we're gonna offer some trainings in January for people like um, greeters and communion helpers, things like that. So if you're interested in trying something maybe that's new, we will train you uh, for what you would need to do. Um, we need, <coughs> never mind, that's okay. Um, we still need a Carillon helper. Uh, we have three who know how to run our Carillons that play the, the bells, the songs before we start the service. And we could use one more to help with that and also maybe do some coordinating because we'd like for people who maybe live nearby enough to hear the bells, we'd like for them to be able to say, hey, could you play something on this day for somebody's birthday or an anniversary or uh, something like that? And we could use somebody to help with some of that coordinating. So if you are willing to uh, learn the bells, let me know or I think it's Nancy and Karen Easterling and Marsha who know how to um, run it and can, can show you the ropes if you're willing. And also, um, I'm offering a blue Christmas meditation like I did last year. That will be Thursday evening at 7, online only, except I've already talked to somebody that I know doesn't do 
um, online, doesn't use the internet and stuff. And I don't see any reason that you can't come in person. Just be aware that it's not a service designed necessarily for in person. Um, so, but come, if that's the way you can participate, come and be here. Otherwise, it'll be online the same as our services on Sunday morning are, and you'll be able to watch it at seven o'clock on Thursday as it's live, or you'll be able to watch it after the fact also. And that's a service that speaks to those who are grieving. So I think that is all I have, and if there's nothing else, well, one thing I forgot, a dozen concerns are in the sign in the view pad there. And uh, if you're watching online, uh, just text it in if you have a concern or a joy, and somebody will bring it up to the pastor after that. Please stand if you are able for our call to worship. Prepare the way for the one who comes. Are you ready to repent and believe? We turn away from false idols and reorient our lives to the one who calls us by name. The call to discipleship carries with it costs, obedience, sacrifice, commitment. We accept the weight of the cross as we proclaim. We will to the will of your will.
will not be you. But let us simply heard and sympathy to all again. Wherever you choose to lead us, let us still be not bound. For whatever you want to teach, prepare us to listen and obey. Amen. seated and we will ask the children and okay we've got one more thing oh that's right sorry add that candle <laughs> have the kids join us Today. Today, on this third Sunday of Advent, we light the pig candle, sometimes known as the shepherd's candle, which symbolizes joy. The joy the world received as Christ's birth. The joy of, in the church as the season of Advent waiting is more than half over. The joy that we find when we turn our wayward hearts back to God. Would you pray with me? Three candles burning bright, chasing away the darkness with light, sending a glimmer of joy, love, and hope to those in despair, letting them know we remember and care giving away a possibility to those who've lost their way. With this candle of joy, we signal God's trust in God's new day. Amen. Hi Graham. Hi Graham, we are here to help you decorate for Christmas. Hi 
Hi, Graham. I love getting ready for Christmas. Hi, Graham. Hi, Graham. This is my favorite time of year. Presents. Why all the fuss over this stuff? Yeah, why all the fuss? Oh, I'm so glad to see you're all excited. Why don't we think about the, you celebrate Christmas? We remember Jesus came to the world as a baby. That's right. Why do we have to decorate? Yeah, why all this stuff? Let's talk about this stuff. The Bible has a lot to say about Jesus' birth. And here's another book that will help us understand some of this stuff. An evergreen tree has a very appropriate name. It is evergreen, always green. It does not become dormant in the winter as other trees do. The color green represents new life and the needles of the evergreen always point up toward heaven. It symbolizes our everlasting life of, with Jesus Christ. We should be be as the evergreen tree, always full of life, never becoming dormant in our life, and with, Jesus, with Christ as our arms are lifted toward heaven. The blood of God is the one who comes down from heaven. He gives Life to the world. Job, John, six thirty three. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I thought it was just a tree. <laughs> but what does this other stuff mean? Let's find out. are used to decorate Christmas trees each and every year. People look for the perfect ones to fit on their tree. Our Christmas tree just wouldn't seem complete without our ornaments. Ornaments can symbolize the blessings in our lives. Our life just wouldn't be complete without God's blessing. Everything that we have is due to God loving us so much that he wants us to shower us with his blessings. Just as ornaments are all different shapes and sizes, blessings are all different as well. God picks and chooses each blessing for us so that it will be just right. So the next time you decorate your tree and as you put up each ornament, think of a blessing that God has given you. I think you'll find that you'll run out of ornaments before you can run out of blessings. Every man shall give as he is able across. According
according to the blessing of the Lord, your God that has that has give, that He has given you. Deuteronomy sixteen point seventeen. What else do we have in the box? Oh, I love candles. Yeah, they are so bright and beautiful. and candles are used to give light. When the room is full of darkness, it is dark, but if you light it like single match in the dark room, the room is light, there may be more darkness, but then light overpowers it. We are that like we can be be the single light in the world of darkness. We must share our light with the world the, so that the light increases. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Matthew. Five fourteen through fifteen. We are lights for God. That's right, for all of us. Look, there are bells. The bell rings out to guide the lost sheep back to the fold, showing that all are precious in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus is our shepherd and he laid down his life for us to that we may spend eternity with him in heaven. He is calling us to follow him with his word. Are you going to listen? Oh, are, are you are you going to listen? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? Matthew 18.12 The bells sound so beautiful. I love listening to them. We are his sheep. So 
So he would go looking for me. Hey, who likes getting a cage? Me! Okay. The key to cage symbolizes multiple snakes. If you hold it upright, it The candy cane symbolizes multiple things. If you hold it upright, it looks like a shepherd's crook. The shepherds were some of the few people who were able to see baby Jesus in the bathroom. If you turn the candy cane upside down, it looks like a J. Jesus starts with the letter J. The, 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 red, the red represents the blood that the, the Jesus shed for us on the cross, and the white represents the purity of Jesus. There are there are candy canes with three small stripes running around it. These stripes symbolize the thirty candy cane, the thirty Godfathers, the Trinity Godfathers, Son and Holy Spirit, who knew that this delicious, simple candy was so pro profound, profoundly symbolic of our Lord Jesus Christ and his simple birth. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. I love this part of Christmas. There is a reason why we do everything. Now I can see how all this stuff has meaning. I'm glad to see you have changed, you are changing your mind. The star is a heavenly sign of prophecy full, fulfilled ages ago, the shining hope for all ma mankind. The star led the wise men to find baby Jesus. These wise men traveled many miles following a star in the sky. The star was their, was their, guide, was their guiding light to the Savior. God was the wise men's travel agent, leading them to the greatest destination known to man, the Savior. We now have his world as our guiding light to lead us to be with him in heaven. Are you going to follow him? And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with great joy. Matthew 2, 9b, 10. I like that the star guided them. I like that we have a Bible to guide us. What other decorations do we have? Our tree looks so pretty. I'm 
imagine you are a lonely shepherd watching over your sheep. This, this night seems no different than any other. Then all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord is in the sky above you, telling you of the, the Savior's birth. You, a shepherd, why did God send an angel to tell shepherds? Because the message that God had about the birth of Jesus was for all people, not just for the right, not just for the Jew, but for everyone. God chose his number one messenger to tell the lowest of the people in the world's eyes of his son's birth. God looks at the heart, not what the world looks at. Thank goodness. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were so so afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Luke 2, 9 to 11. The angels was like a messenger for God. The angels told God the good news of Jesus' birth. Wow, I didn't know that. What about the other stuff? Look, I found some holly. stands for. The leaves represent the crown of thorns that were placed upon Jesus' head as he was being crucified. The berries symbolize the blood that he shed for us. He endured criticism, excruciating excruciating pain and embarrassment, all for you and I. The next time you see a decoration with holly on it, remember what was done for you so that you can spend eternity with him. I know I will. together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. And twisted together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail the King of Jews, Matthew 27, 29. That's amazing what he did for us. What is the wreath for, Graham? Let's hang it over there. Just as there is no beginning or end of Jesus' eternal love for us, just as the wreath looks the same throughout and seems not to not change, so will he 
will always be the same. Jesus shed Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13 I love how it looks. I didn't know it had meaning. It's a great reminder that even as we change, Jesus never does. Now, what about the presents? They can't have any meaning, right? Oh, you'd be surprised. These days, the world has forgotten the reason for Christmas. Most people seem to think that getting presents is the greatest thing about Christmas. Other people seem to think that presents has nothing to do with Christmas. Well, they are both wrong. The wise men came to visit Jesus as a young child and gave him presents. They gave him gold, frankincense, and, and myrrh. They offered him gold as a king, praying to him tribute, frankincense as as God, for they mur uh, for the for they honored God with the smoke of incense and myrrh, as a man that should die for myrrh was used was used in unveiling dead bodies. These men, these wise men saw this child and knew that he is a king, is God, and, and that he would die for the sins of the world. How can any how can anyone with the knowledge that we have now not believe? The wise men went to the house where they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their trap. They gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Matthew 2 11. I love getting presents. I didn't know that's why we get gifts. Jesus is the greatest gift of gift of all. I never knew the wise men's gifts had meanings. What about the wrapping? That's just something you do, right? Yes and no. They do have spiritual meaning, and it's good for us to remember. spend hours wrapping all of their presents during Christmas time. They use ribbons, garland, and bows to make sure that their presents are as beautiful as possible. What they don't realize is that the items that they use to complete the outside of the gift have more meaning than the actual gift inside. The bow ties our present with a beautiful ribbon, just as Jesus ties us as Christians together in his love. We may not be in the same family, but we but we are all in the family of God. Jesus is the ribbon that bonds us together. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Colossians 3.14 I thought the wrapping was to hide the presents inside. There's really a lot to think about. I never knew all this stuff had meaning. People do go a little crazy about this stuff of Christmas. 
the parties, the gift giving, the busyness of the season. What we need to do is slow down, enjoy every moment by remembering the true meaning of Christmas. Now, who wants cookies? I do. I know there is not a meaning in the cookies. Oh, you would be surprised. Making cookies is a favorite pastime for most families during the Christmas season. Cookie cutters are used to turn ordinary dough into edible masterpieces. God doesn't use cookie cutters. When he creates each one of us, he makes every one of us so special and unique that you would have to break the mold after just one use. He is the potter and we are his clay. He wants to mold us into his masterpiece. We only need to be moldable and willing to follow his lead. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, hand are you in my hand? O house of Israel, Jeremiah 18, 6. Thank you for helping me decorate. Thank you for teaching us the meaning of the of the decorations. Uh, one more thing. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Learn something new. And 
we kind of did that this morning. I'm guessing everybody might have learned a little something new. So, here are the list of the thing, same things I just read, things you can look at at home and see how many of them you can do. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you provide to us, for the blessings that we celebrate at Christmas, for the blessings of your human touch, the blessings we have of being here together in a space that we know as your home, sharing some of us in person and some of us virtually in a time of worship and fellowship together with you and one another. And Lord, we do ask that you would make your healing presence known to those who are this day in need of it. For Karen and the families of those who have come to be with you, many of them so recently, we ask that you would offer your healing and comfort and strength to grieving families and help them to know your healing touch in the special ways that they have need. For those whose names are listed here with dealing with cancer, recovering from surgeries and injuries and illness, for Deb who has gone to hospice and is receiving the care she needs, 
We thank you for that healing presence and ask that each one would know that you are with them each day. Offering, yes, healing to body, also to mind and spirit and relationships where such help is needed. We ask that you make your presence known among us as we continue in a time of worship and fellowship together. And that as we go from this place, we might be ready to answer your call, sharing what we have with those who are in need, offering forgiveness where we need to and asking for forgiveness where it is needed so that we might be ready to receive your grace as you come to us as your church celebrates on Christmas morning. And all of these things we ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand as we're able, and if you'd like to follow along in the book, this one is in the faith we sing, number 2152. Words are also on the screen. Baptize you with water for repentance. 
But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Is it just me, or did the kids give us quite a message to think about this morning? Anybody learn anything new as they went through the, the symbols? There were a couple of things that I hadn't heard explained quite the way they did. So yeah, that was, it was interesting to hear them talk about all of this, the symbolism. I'm not going to give you another full sermon, 15, 20 minute sermon, like I might on another Sunday morning. I'll let you reflect on what all those things at Christmas time, the candy canes, the bells, the ornaments, the star, the tree, the holly, the wreath, the candles, presents, wrapping paper, cookies, and angels really mean as they all point us to Jesus in some way or another. I just want to call our attention for a moment to John the Baptist. We've been, our theme for Advent has been prepare the way for the Lord, and we're talking a lot about John the Baptist in this season. And one of the primary ways he prepares us for Jesus' coming, and that was baptism for repentance and forgiveness of sins. John likely spent some time with a religious group called the Essenes while he was growing up. The Essenes separated themselves from those who they saw as sinners. But John was driven by the idea that God cared for sinners and wanted to forgive and rescue them. John's mission was to draw people to God, calling them to repent. So as the kids asked, you know, what do all these symbols mean and why do we put them up for decoration, I'll ask us to think of the same question regarding regarding repentance. What does it mean, and why do we need it? Metanoia is a Greek word translated as repent. It actually means to change your mind and heart to the extent that the change turns your actions around. And why do we need repentance? Because of sin. The Greek word for sin is hamartia. And it actually is an archery term, meaning to miss the mark. Something we do all the time in one way or another, even when we have the best intentions. We give in to temptation, we fail to get around to something we should be doing, we miss the mark. A group of fourth century Christian monks came up with a list of seven deadly sins. Now, they are mostly talked about in the Catholic tradition, but these were the seven deadly sins known as such because they are believed to be kind of the foundation from which other sins come. And those are gluttony, lust, greed, indifference. And this one reminds me of Revelations 3, 14 to 22, the letter in Revelations to the Laodicean church, who was neither hot nor cold. They were indifferent. Number five was anger. Not the emotion, but the actions that can come from anger, and maybe the bitterness that sets in if we don't deal with anger as it occurs. Number six is envy, and number seven is pride. Note that several of these kind of correspond to the Ten Commandments, especially those like coveting and stealing, maybe lying or even killing in extreme cases, if you're jealous or really coveting something someone else has. It leads to some extremes sometimes. How many have we done, how many of these things have we done at least on a small scale on a regular basis, if we really think about it. The problem of sin isn't so much about following rules as it is about compassion and mercy. John wanted to help his hearers be ready for the day of the Lord by having their hearts, minds, and actions cleansed by repentance. 
His sense of urgency about the Lord's coming caused him to use powerfully harsh words with his listeners who were still stuck in sin. You brood of vipers, or children of snakes, depending on your translation. John's harshest words were for the church leaders, like the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees who were named in the passage. These leaders tended to put on a good show, but not necessarily have sincere hearts. They emphasized the wrong of minor offenses, letting some more important sins go, straining at gnats and swallowing camels, as Jesus put it in Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24. They harped on others for sins they were committing themselves, like enforcing the Sabbath law about no work. If you were working, even walking too far on the Sabbath, they'd catch you doing so and you hear about it. But these were the people who had the job of enforcing the law, so what were they doing on the Sabbath if they're harping at somebody but working themselves, right? So these were the ones that, that John talked to. What would John say to us in our materialistic, legalistic, politi politically and financially motivated world today? Can you imagine the letter we might get from John today or the words he would have for us if he were present among us? He said to his early listeners, bear fruit worthy of repentance. For them that meant, according to Luke 3, anyone who has extra clothes or food should share them with others. Tax collectors should only collect what was due and they were known for collecting more. And soldiers are warned not to cheat or harass anyone, but to be satisfied with what they have. Can you hear the same kind of instructions if John were to be here today? Notice that John speaks of actions, even though repentance has to start with a change of mind and heart. He calls for bearing fruit, which is seen in our actions. You can't always witness what's going on in somebody's heart, although God knows. What we know is by the actions we see. The fruit is on the outside showing what's happening on the inside, like flowers or literal fruits on a plant. It's evidence on the outside of changes that are happening inside. Advent is, as I've said before, the time of waiting and preparing for Christ's coming. It's a good time to start turning our lives around in a way that lasts all year. If you're taking John at his word this Advent season, examining your heart and cooperating with God to turn around, consider finding a confidant with whom you can share confession. Or try writing a prayer of confession, keeping it where you can see it as a reminder, since sin is hard to quit cold turkey and we might have to repent every day for a while, confess every day, maybe more than once a day for a while before we feel free of the sin we're confessing. As this season of Advent continues, may we continue to prepare the way for the Lord. It's just one more week until we recognize the coming of Christ at Christmas Eve and Christmas morning. Let us spend that time preparing our hearts and our minds and our lives for Christ to come. And let us pray. And Lord, we do thank you for John and for those people who play the same role in our lives, turning us toward you when we have gone astray, bringing us together with the unity that you give. <clears throat> helping us to understand you better, to worship and to live more faithfully. In this last week of Advent, let us examine our hearts. Be sure that we have turned toward you so that we are ready to celebrate your grace, to receive your forgiveness, and to express and share the joy that you give. 
when Christmas morning comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. We mentioned sharing with others from what we have, and let us do just that as we call the ushers forward for our morning offerings. <laughs>
where we do have coffee hour immediately as we close the service, um, directly behind us. And you're all invited, please, whether you brought anything or not, stay, enjoy the fellowship, and I'm sure there will be enough food. And let us pray together. And gracious God, we thank you for your forgiveness. And as we turn and face the opposite direction as we leave this space, may it be a reminder that we turn our lives, our hearts, our minds toward you. And as we go forth, some of us to share food together and others to share a midday meal elsewhere. May we know your presence and we give you thanks for all that you provide. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.